big news, of course, on Sunday in Boston was that Dominic Cruz came back and won what he never lost. He is now the new slash old UFC bantamweight champion, the undisputed bantamweight champion. He won via split decision. It was inspiring. Just him getting to that point, being in the cage and fighting was inspiring. And then seeing what he did, considering the time off, considering the injuries, was one of the greatest things I've ever seen in all of sports, period, in my 33 years on this earth. And I am honored that he is joining us right now via the phone. Dominic, are you there? I am here. What's up, Ariel? What's up, man? Congratulations. Wow. What an amazing... Uh, I, I, it's, just, it's hard for me still to truly digest what we saw on Sunday. Now, you know, a little less than two days later, what's it like for you? Are you on cloud nine? How would you describe your emotions? You know, it's... Yeah, it's yeah, I feel pretty good just because when you get done with um, fighting like that, it's just nice to have some days off. Like, I got to sleep in today till 11. I didn't have to wake up and train in the morning. And um, it's just nice to kind of be off. It's like just like being off work, you know? It's like a couple of days of vacation. It's, it's nice. What about the feedback? Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, other than that, it's just, it's weird because my life doesn't really change too much, whether I'm in camp or I'm out of camp. It shows me how much I actually enjoy what I do. Uh, where are you now? I'm at home. I'm in my bedroom uh-huh. talking to you in my altitude tent. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I think we need to get you know this out of the way right off the top. Physically, how are you feeling? Because a lot of people are concerned, of course, with the limping and all that. What's going on? Yeah, well, people are concerned because you know, Dana at the press conference says that I'm... Um, I'm injury prone and that I'm hurt again. And he doesn't even know. I right. said that my foot hurt. I just got done with the five round fight. Why don't you give me a second to like feel my body out? I was still in the cage when he was asking me, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, adrenaline is wore off and I've had a couple of days to let everything kind of settle. And it was just my foot that that's hurting the worst right now. I mean, I took leg kicks and of course you, you're used to taking leg kicks. Um, so that, that honestly wasn't, the big worry is my left foot. My, I I came into this with with a tendon injury on the bottom of my foot because I just do I do a lot of hopping around and it it wore down on my foot throughout the camp. And uh, if you look at pictures and like anything like that, you can see I almost always had one shoe on the whole camp. And <laughs> everybody was like, "Why do you only have one shoe on?" I was just trying to keep and preserve that foot for fight night. <clears throat> it's all good to go. I think I just got to go get an MRI. That's the next step. I see a foot specialist later on today. And, uh, you know, I I really think it's going to be fine, but you don't know until you get an MRI because tendons are weird. There's no breaks out. When did you suffer that? Uh, Well, I I mean, it started hurting me right at the very beginning of camp. It's called plantar fascia tendonitis, and it's basically real bad swelling of the connection point to the the arch of your foot to your heel. So you have like a tendon that goes all the way through the arch of your foot and where it connects to your heel, it like tears off the heel right there and it creates inflammation. It happens on football players, uh, like a lot of quarterbacks where they post on that back foot where they fire the, the throw, you know? Mm-hmm. It'll happen to them. It'll happen to runners a lot. And I've been, I run a lot in my camps. I do a lot of footwork, so my feet take some abuse. And I think, uh, you know, it just got a little bit inflamed, but, once I check it out, make sure nothing tore off there. It should be fine. I just got to let the inflammation go down. How would you uh, assess the uh, the dynamic at the press conference? Because you mentioned again, you know, Dana saying what he said. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking into it too much. And, of course, you just fought. So, you know, it got to give you the benefit of the doubt. But it felt like there was a little bit of tension there. Is that accurate? With what? Uh, between you and Dana. I don't know. I always feel a little tension from Dana to me. I, I don't know why. He just, you know, he never really completely, I feel like, takes my side when it comes to, um, you know, sometimes decisions or fights that are made. You know, I think that he believes that that fight could have easily gone the other way. And you never know it, Dana. He, he likes certain styles. He likes certain fights. And uh, you just hope that he, he backs up somebody like me who's done so much on Fox to promote the UFC, promote all these events. Even when I was injured, I do everything I can to do what I can for his company you know, as an employee. And then I went in there and, and did that the other night. And I, I hope I have his support, but you, you just can't ever tell with Dana. So 
it's nothing personal with me. It's just a question of you never know what's going through Dana's head at any given time. He could be upset about very many different things. The guy's got a lot of responsibilities. So I'm not going to sit here and try to pretend I know what's going through Dana's mind. No way. Mm. Uh, after the fight in the back, did him or Lorenzo, anyone come up to you and share their thoughts on the fight, congratulate you, anything like that happen? No, it didn't happen. Hmm. Um, were you expecting that? No, you can't expect that from those guys. Those guys, think of how many shows they go to, Ariel. Yeah. For one. And then you got to think, like, after they get done with the show, they're probably ready to just get on their jet and get out of there ASAP, I would think. I mean, they have so they have big jobs. They got money, big money to make in a million different places. And, you know, while it's a, it might be one of the more important um, steps in my life for them, it's just another fight show. So... Um, uh, it doesn't really surprise me that I didn't hear a whole lot. They shook my hand when I was in there, and the one thing they did ask me was how I was after the fight. Right. And and, and that was it. And I was in the cage when I was still still hurting, you know, So and, I, and I, my adrenaline was still pumping. Um, I remember there was a little bit of frustration when I was celebrating after the win. He's just like, here, you put it on. He gave them the belt. Didn't want to put it around my waist because I was hopping around too much. So... You just don't know. I mean, you just, I need to sit down and talk with those guys face to face and, uh, see what's going on. You know I mean? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, my contract was set under a lot of different stipulations from four years ago from when I was, you know, competing and I was still on the WEC contract when I renegotiated my contract four years ago, uh, to what my contract is at now. So it's like, you know, there's just a lot of talking we got to do and, um, I think that, you know, I do a lot for this division and I've done a lot for the UFC and not just for myself, but for, for their, uh, organization. And, uh, I just want to make sure they know I'm a team player and I'm trying to do what I can to help them out too. Yeah. Last thing on this, uh, you mentioned, uh, if you were a golfer, you can make more. Has this been bothering you? Like, did you feel, okay, this is bothering me, but I'm going to wait till after the fight and then I'm going to sit down. It, it felt like you were getting some stuff out. Is that? No, well, you just see, you see. The only thing that happens is I get done with the fight <clears throat> and then they shove microphones in my face. And right. I, <laughs> I fought for five rounds. You know, it was a tough fight. A lot of energy was exerted. My adrenaline's pumping. I'm just out of the press conference. Uh, and then you're going to shove a camera in my face and you're going to put a, put a microphone. I mean, so you know what ends up happening, Ariel? Is I'm me. Mm. You get me. You just get a thousand percent me. And sometimes... It's better if I just, you know, uh, could could keep my candy coat shell on sometimes because it kind of saves some live scenarios. But I guess when I was in that situation, I was just speaking my mind, speaking my soul. And when it comes down to fighting and making money and playing golf and making money, it's not like I lied. I mean, telling me that playing golf isn't easier on my body and more money, I mean... I don't think that's an argument. So it's not that I was trying to bash anybody, but it was that I said that golfers get plantar fasciitis in their foot, and here I am with it in fighting. And the only difference is the workload on our bodies. So it was just me talking. Man. It was just me being me. I mean, at least you know I'm not out there trying to pretend something I'm not. Oh, no. And I think it's very well received. As I asked you in the scrum at the media workouts, it's amazing how just being yourself can lead to such positive feedback. Like I said, I mean, I'm not just saying it because you're here. You've become one of, if not the most interesting interviews in the sport just because you're being yourself and you're a pretty damn interesting guy and people like the truth. And I think people can see when someone is being truthful. I don't know if you read the comments and you see the feedback, but it's almost been this revelation like, wow, where has this Dominic been? Um do you, you, you read that? Do you see that? And does it make you want to do it more? No, I wasn't. The thing is, Ariel, I haven't been trying to do something different, man. It's I'm in the spotlight again, and I haven't been in four years. Yeah. Everybody's so shocked about this, but I mean, I mean, come on. How much have you changed in the last four years yourself, Ariel, with just the things you learn, the life you've led? Now, I've had to really, really, like, gather myself together on, on several different occasions throughout this last four years. And um, not just that, but I've had a different outlook. I got to sit on the outside, on the other side of the cameras, and learn that perspective also, and learn, you know, 
what's important to the UFC more than fighting ability and what's important to selling tickets more than fighting ability. And people want to hear your opinion. That's what sells. Mm. People want to hear what you think of yourself. That sells. And it only sells because people like coming up right now are scared to do it. So you don't see it a lot. It's a scary thing to say what you're going to do and tell everybody what you believe because then people have a, have a choice to make an opinion about you. If you just ride the happy medium, ride the fence, and try to play Mr. Nice Guy, even if you're not that, uh, people feel that. They, they feel your, your insincerities, and they know that you, you're not being real up there. You know, I mean, the best example I could give was when Dillashaw said that I wasn't being a great example, it wasn't being a good role model, because I was trash-talking before the fight. It's like, that's just his own brain telling him that none of that's real because if I sat in a room with TJ Dillashaw and said any of the things I said, he'd fire right back at me. The only reason he doesn't is because he's scared of the judgments he's going to get when he does that on camera. And, uh, that's his problem, not mine. Have you watched the fight? Yeah, I watched it. What's your takeaway? How'd you score it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, see me, I see me going out there and winning. I mean, if anything, if I could see it going any way, because it was, it was back and forth, I would see it give me the first three hmm. easily, and then the fifth could be a draw, and I'll give him the fourth. Okay. I'll definitely give him the fourth round. Um, he, he got me with some good leg shots that I didn't make the adjustment to. But, you know, that was later in the rounds. He had to figure that out because he, was, he, he had to give up on the head hunt. See, normally it goes the other way around. He was so confident in getting the finish because Ludwig was looking for the left and the right high kicks off of the flow that um, he went for the head kicks more than he went for the low kicks early. And by going for the head kicks early, that's just usually, it usually in kickboxing goes the other way around. They start low and go high because that gets the guys to drop the hands and make different reads. But instead he started high and then went low later. So, the adjustments had to be made on both sides. He made the adjustment to do that in the fourth round. And I made the adjustment um, with the takedowns when he started throwing low. So between the two of us, we were just making adjustments the entire fight. And I knew that that's what the fight was going to come down to. I said that in all my interviews. That, uh, you know, he's a, he's a fighter. Tillshaw's good. I, I'm not going to say he wasn't good. I'm not going to say he didn't go out there and throw down. But... I win because I give credit to the to the abilities of my opponents. You know, I may not like TJ Dillashaw, the human being, because I think he's fake and just kind of plays plays what he thinks people want to hear more than he plays himself. But it doesn't mean I don't respect his fighting ability, and I know what he's good at. I studied what he's good at. I knew exactly what he was going to be bringing to the table. I, I've had very many looks in my camp to create TJ Dillashaw. Uh, the biggest thing you got to make... Uh, adjustments to and the reads to in the fight is the speed, the timing, and uh, what punch count he likes the best. And once I could get a read on that in the first round, I was good from there. Did he surprise you with anything? Um, I think the only thing he surprised me with was the, the way that the kicks came off and how much he committed to them. Like, even though he was missing kicks, he still committed to the high kicks over and over and over. And uh, I expected him to probably just let up on the on the high kicks because I was because he was missing so much. But he didn't. He just he just kept trying for him. But I mean, somewhat to his demise. But it was that that was probably the only thing is he just kept kicking and kicking. Two part question about the takedowns. A when you got the first couple, did that increase your confidence and B let's say you're a judge. How much weight should we put into those takedowns? Because it does seem, and, and for the record, I think I told you this on the set, I scored it one, two, and three for you, four and five for him. How much weight should we put into those takedowns? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, he's never been taken down in his entire career. Yep. So that's one thing you got to think about. I took him down four or five times in a fight and two times in one round back to back. Yep. So that's me pushing the aggression. Then you have to think only people who wrestle understand the, the amount of energy that goes into that and why you don't see a lot of people trying to wrestle TJ Dillashaw. 
Okay, now let, let's look at that in the, into that further as an analyst. The reason why people don't shoot on T.J. Dillashaw is because he's an offensive fighter. Pure offense is his defense. He throws such a high volume at such a high rate with such power that he keeps you from being able to time any kind of takedown or read any kind of takedown because what is a takedown? A takedown is offensive yourself. People are scared to use their offensive takedowns because they're too defensive from his offense. When he outputs so much, you end up using up your energy trying to not get beat up by T.J. Dillshaw. Well, I had energy for both because I knew that. I knew he was going to be coming hard. And I knew that his offense was going to be what the one thing I had to use against him because his defense wasn't as good as mine. So what's the best offense is a good defense is my mindset. If you can't hit me, none of your offense is going to matter. Hmm. If you can't hit me, none of your power is going to matter. And to be honest, the only way it matters is against him. So he beats himself, essentially, as long as I can make him miss. And um, that's what I had to do. I mean, he landed some, but on the percentages, um, you know, I beat him in the numbers pretty much everywhere. Takedown, submission. I did have a submission attempt that I slipped off the top of. Um, you know, I, I landed at a higher significant strike rate. And he had more output, but I made him have more output without it paying off which ends up working against him. To that point, you know, it was obviously back and forth, and I know that you you never liked when people would say that he was copying your style or he was like you or better than you. It seems like they want the rematch, and that's no surprise. We had Bang on earlier in the show, um, and he was saying, you know, to a degree, sometimes when he was missing you, that was actually part of the game plan to set up other things. He also said, if you're wondering, that technically as a striker, you are quote-unquote horrible. Um do you feel, though, that you proved your point with all those misses? Do you feel, though, by winning and getting the takedowns and doing what you did that you proved your point? Would you like to move on from T.J. Dillashaw at this point? Oh, man, I mean, I mean, this is a fighter, so you got to know that the excuse to come, especially from silly Dwayne Ludwig. I mean, that guy's been talking the whole time, and now he's got all the trash talk. You know what I mean? He's talking about being Mr. Nice Guy. and The true colors come out of these guys uh, when they get upset. They're very emotional. They're very... And, and that's what I used against them to beat them. And they're pissed about it. And um, I told them, I told them they were going to have a time, hard time finding me. He said, missing me was part of the game plan, but okay, so be it. That's how he lost too. I mean, there's just so many different ways you can look at this. Quote, unquote, my striking um, is, is horrible in his opinion. Well, that's his opinion, you know. Um, <laughs> when I look at fighters, and I look at styles, and I look at body types, I'm not going to fight like T.J. Delshaw, and Delshaw's not going to fight like me. We have two different body types, two different skeletons. I've used my body to the best of my ability to become a winner with what I have. That, and that's what I've done. Mm. And T.J.'s done that up to this point also. Um, you know, he might say I wasn't good as a striker fundamentally, but... It's not like T.J. Dillashaw's face looked particularly pretty at the end of the fight either. So I still did the damage I needed to do, and I proved the point that as much as you want to just walk through my punches, you can't because you'll get lit up, taken down, and beat up. And the harder you come, the more I'm going to hit you. I, I know in the moment you weren't, uh, you weren't too willing to talk about your eye Faber. And by the way, for the record, it is in fact 0 for 3 in UFC title fights. You were putting me on the spot there, but I got gotcha. you. You can't okay, rattle me. Yeah, you got me on that one. My, unless, <laughs> well, we were counting the WEC, too, in our Reebok deal, so why wouldn't we count the WEC in the fight fair, deal? Fair enough. Um, that, you know, he had one against Aldo. He had uh, the fight against Brown that he lost. But anyway, regardless. Um, so five what, 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 in a row. What sells the most? And also, he also had the, the Brown rematch, so you, you, can, you can add that. But that's besides okay. the point. <laughs> what sells the in a row. What sells the I'm most? Just being in... honest here, I'm not trying to no, I know. downgrade anything. It's just six title shots in a row, and he gets these title shots because of the talking and the running that he's doing now. He just he's a strategic salesman. And but that's, that's the fight game, the right? That's why I asked that question. That's why I asked that question, you know, because that's the point I'm trying to make. He's a strategic salesman, and yes, that's why he's in the money fight. That doesn't mean that he's as great as he says he is. Sure, it just means he's a strategic salesman. And for that, you'll give him credit. Have you put further thought into what you'd like next? 
Uh, I yeah, I don't really care, man. I mean, the fans want to see Faber because we were supposed to have that third outing. He's the only guy who beat me back in 2007. So I don't have any problem with fa- facing Faber. I don't have any problem with facing any of these guys. I just want to be compensated for it, and uh, I want to make the best out of it. I think that um, at this point in my career, with the things that I've been able to be blessed enough to do and, and keep my body for, you know, it's definitely been not the easiest for, for me to stay in there and stay busy. Yeah. So I just want to make the best of it, you know, and I want to make the best of it with the best fights I can quality over quantity. If uh, need, need be. Um, TJ just posted on Instagram like a couple of minutes ago, amazingly, uh, about the fight, and uh, there weren't any excuses or anything there, but he did say something that's uh, garnering some interest. He said that he thought that the commentary, and particularly Joe Rogan, was biased against him, that he was favoring you. Well, I disagree wh- completely. Why? It's funny. It's funny because it's funny that he, of all people, is going to say that, you know, because it, it goes... Joe just says what he's going to say, but there was no bias whatsoever. There were times where he took TJ's side a lot. Um, and besides that, judges don't hear Joe Rogan. Fans do at home. So it's like you can't worry about what Joe's saying. You just got to go out there and do what you're doing. I've had fights where I haven't had the better end of the commentary, definitely. But you got to understand, too, that you know Joe doesn't necessarily have the most – understanding of the striking realm and that fight was a very high level striking match that I guarantee you Joe didn't see everything that TJ was reading and Joe didn't see everything that I was reading because then you got to think that both of me and TJ are working off our instincts in there a lot because we're moving so quickly switching so many stances it's hard to make a lot of reads so that forces instincts to come out stronger and that's where I fight at my best and that's how I made TJ fight I made him fight off of instinct instead of the reads and the wants that he wanted from from Dwayne Ludwig and his instincts lost in that fight and my instincts won me that fight um Joe Rogan I don't think he picked a side at all I mean Joe's I've I've hung out with Joe a couple times I've never been on his podcast those guys have been on his podcast millions of times so I know Joe has no problem with TJ I know he respects TJ and he likes his style um so I think Joe's just doing his job he he could have commented more towards me or more towards him, but I think, I think that uh, TJ is just really breaking things down because he knows it was a it was a it was an all out war, and he, he just is really looking at it pissed off right now. I mean, he needs to let the emotions settle a little bit and watch it in a month or something because that's always what happens when you first watch fights. Emotions are still very high, and I think that TJ is just very emotional right now. Uh, I'll ask you this question uh, before we wrap this up, and I know you're no uh, sports historian, but did what Dominic Cruz accomplish on Sunday in that cage, is that, in your opinion, from what you've heard, I don't know if you would spent time reading about this stuff, I learned over the weekend that there's a guy named Thomas Davis on the Carolina Panthers who suffered three ACL injuries in the same leg, so not quite like you, but similar. Is what you accomplished one of the greatest athletic achievements in the history of sports? Because I, I can't see, I can't find an equal. You know, the thing about that, Ariel, is it's so hard to say that because people criticize you so much for being injured. I mean, you hear Dana is a big example of that. He's, you know, I'm injury prone to him instead of I go out there and lay my body out on the line. There's two different ways you can look at it, Mm -hmm. right? Well, a lot of people will say because I've been injured so much, you know, that's it. I'm I'm just, that's that's all I really am. And then other people would argue it's harder to come back from all these injuries and do what I've done. I think that because I've lived it, I know the truth. And I know what I did was not my best. I know that I could be better. I know that there's things that I can do much better than I did on that night. And while I wasn't rusty, I'm better than what I showed. And that's what I look forward to coming back and doing. It's showing a better version of me with more time, more rounds, um, I had to do a lot of this on the fly, man. I came off of knee surgery and went straight into camp. I didn't have an adjustment period, so that means I had to go from not sparring at all to sparring five rounds. There's no, there's no leeway in that, and I had to be able to keep 
not just do that, but I had to be able to do it with somebody who so far has kept the highest offensive pace of anybody in the division besides myself. So, yeah, what I did, in my personal opinion, was harder than anybody's going to ever understand or give me credit for. Mm. But that's why it's important that the things that we do have to be for ourselves because somebody else is always going to downplay what you're doing forever for the rest of our lives. I've watched the very end of our interview on Sunday, maybe like 30 times, where you said that the best moment of your life, I, I've asked that question to people before in that spot, and it's always, yes, this is the best moment. You threw me a curveball, and you said the best moment was when you realized you didn't need the belt to be happy. And we were kind of running out of time, so I didn't want to follow up, so I'll end the interview the way I wanted to. When was that moment? When did you realize you didn't need that belt to be happy? After I blew my knee out the second time, when I finally gave up on, on it, I said, um, I finally had to say, you know, Dom, you need to just stop because you have to find another way to live. It's really, really, I don't know if everybody's like this, but the way I am, I I just go all in on something. So when I'm in, when I'm fighting, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it with every ounce of my ability. When I'm, when I'm breaking down fights, I do it with every ounce of my ability. When I'm, uh, you know, doing color commentary next to Rogan and Michael. I, I know all the fighters. I mean, I just make sure I'm ready. So before I got hurt, I didn't know how to live really any other portion of life. I didn't know what I was without fighting. I didn't, fighting was my, uh, it was like a drug for me. And when it got taken away, I was forced to deal with sobriety. And sobriety for me was vicious. Uh, it was very hard for me to deal with. But when I finally wrapped my head around it and finally realized that I was stuck in sobriety without fighting, and that's what I mean by sobriety, like mm. life without fighting. Yep, yep. Uh, it really forced me to deal with a lot of my own issues, man. Like a, a lot of the stuff that's inside me. And what's crazy is my gifts are my curse. <laughs> yeah. So uh, everything that makes me what I am as a fighter is also what makes life outside of fighting so difficult for me. Uh, but... All those things were learned over this time, and I didn't have my belt, and I was talking about T.J. Dillshaw and the great things that he's been doing to earn that belt while I was out, Hennon Brown and the great things he was doing, and all these other athletes. I had to set myself aside, set my own issues aside, and put, and put my focus on them at that point. And the only way to do that was to really give up on the fighting portion of things so I could let go of my uh, comp- competitive nature. And during that whole time, man, yeah, I just really learned that uh, I didn't need to have that belt to be happy because I was living every day just fine. Uh, going to rehab to, to fix myself, going to Fox, working with you guys, taking notes, leaving, coming home. Just I, was have, I had a good life, and, and I was happy, even if I had, could never have fought again. Mm. And now I get to come back and fight, and it's like a cherry on top. So... I don't have so much pressure in that belt anymore. That belt, well, I, well, I want to have it because it represents what I've done for myself and, and, uh, and I'm one of the best in the world, pound for pound, and the best in the world at 135. While that's good to feel, I won the competition, but the real competition that we're living is life, evolving, being happy in life, and that's the hardest thing to do, and that, that's what my goal is. And so now I, I, I envision you just sitting back and just staring at that belt. It, you don't need it to be happy, but it, it's pretty damn nice to have it back home, right? Yeah, it's just nice. I needed, uh, I needed to know, you know, doing that is bigger than the fight. It's about something that I have in myself now that I know I have. Like, I have a different type of will. I have a different type of toughness. I have a different type of mentality, and I know that, and I proved it to myself. So that's two different things than before I had the belt. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I still had to prove it. I still had to tell myself that I had it. I, everything that I said leading up to the fight is what I believed, but I also knew that I still had to prove it. You know what I mean? And I went out there with that on my mind for 12, 15 weeks, three years, however you want to call it, that I still had something to prove to myself. And as long as I could prove something to myself and everybody else would be shocked right along with me. Yeah, it is a beautiful thing 
what you accomplished there, man. I really, really uh, appreciate the time and uh, really happy for you. It was, uh, it was amazing. I, I was just honored to be there watching it in person. Congratulations on everything. Congratulations on getting the belt back. Congratulations on coming back, proving a lot of people wrong. Enjoy being champion again, and I hope that you get, uh, I hope that you get what you want when you talk to the UFC. I certainly think you deserve it. Who the hell am I? But uh, I, I am uh, I'm just blown away. It's, it's really hard, so I don't know how you can do it. It's hard for me to digest it all. Again, congratulations, Dominic. Happy for you, and thank you for coming on the show. I know you're very busy today, so it means a lot. Thanks, Ariel. All right. Talk to you soon. There he is, Dominic Cruz, stopping by. Uh, great stuff from him. Once again, he is the bantamweight champion.